The following is an analysis, interpretation, and summary of James Clear's book, Atomic Habits. Chapter 9, The Role of Family and Friends in Shaping Habits. So in the last chapter, we talked about how do we make a habit irresistible? How do we make it easier for us to do by stacking and using temptation building and understanding the dopamine-driven feedback loop? Now, going on law two, to make a, how to have, make a habit more attractive, we're going to talk about another piece of the environment component, which is family and friends and the circle that you keep around you. The habits that are normal in your circle, culture, and environment tend to be the most attractive and are learned from a young age. So we have to peel it back and look at what happened in childhood. Because often we, in, in an effort to try and survive and thrive in our environment, we adopt all types of unconscious habits that we're not really particularly aware of, maybe until even adulthood. Some people go there almost their entire lives without realizing some of the programming and indoctrination that they have been, uh, that have been placed on them and they never write their own story. They're kind of living out someone else's story that, and standards and principles and values. Speaking of social norms, there is a certain pull social norms have. You know, because one of the deepest human desires is to feel like you belong. You want to be part of the tribe so you can survive. It is not an evolutionary advantage to be an outcast. Now, outcasts can have tribes and groups and like, you can have the most, you can be on the fringe of ideas and concepts and radical ideas. And there is almost always a collective or a group of people who you can communicate to and resonate with and find a family. And you don't need many people, even if it's just a dozen, a couple of dozen, like that's enough to formulate a sense of community. And so the risk of getting separated from the tribe is very small nowadays. The term, the lone wolf dies, but the pack survives, is very relevant to our previous ancestral history, hunter-gatherer selves, but now it expresses itself more in minority of circumstances and stories where we'll hear about, you know, people distancing themselves from communities and suffering as a result of it. Those who learn to collaborate and improvise prevail. And James talks about, you know, how we don't actually choose our earlier habits, we imitate them. We learn them from our environment. And this is particularly true if we're talking under 18, you know, teenage years and even younger than that. We imitate our environment in a way to learn, to adapt and survive. From school, local community, the church, parents, grandparents, the current culture and entertainment that you absorb through the internet and social media. Like that is all assimilating an identity. These inform our expectations, our standards of how we live in early life, and these invisible rules are formed not of your own choosing necessarily, but by osmosis. I mean, yeah, technically osmosis, you're going from an area of high concentration to low concentration. I know that's not, it's just it's just the idea and concept how you're getting like this, this, well actually diffusion, you're getting this like, sorry, that's diffusion. You're getting this like diffusion of like, values and lessons and behaviors across to you you know it's like we're we're very malleable uh like the the physiological term is neuroplasticity and this term is more like physiological nature where we're talking about motor skills and motor tasks how why are we when we're young we're so malleable why are we so able to learn and acquire new skills and motor tasks so quickly and efficiently well it's because we our neuroplasticity is so high neuroplasticity being that, our ability to learn and acquire new skills. And it peaks just around puberty, just on the onset of puberty. And so this neurophysiological plasticity also couples with this uh, value plasticity, this character plasticity that we also see. We probably see even, you know, around the same similar time, but if we go even a little bit earlier, you know, imitating the behaviors, the subconscious behaviors of our surroundings helps us fit in helps gives us a sense of belonging because that is ultimately what all of us are looking for whether we admit it or not we're looking for this sense of belonging you know whether you you know every time you subscribe to someone on youtube or you you follow somebody on a podcast like you join a part of a community you know i think in really popular influencers entertainers and artists and podcasters the comment section on their channels 
and, and platforms, it serves as a like community that many people look forward to coming back to. People get a sense of belonging by being, and forgive me for using this example so often, but it's so prevalent, a Joe Rogan fan. Like he referenced himself, uh, I believe I've heard him say, it's like that comment section is something that he's working to get back on the Spotify platform because of how a valuable tool it is for interaction and humor and silliness and get people getting a sense of belonging about being like a Joe Rogan fan. That's a community. Like people make pages called, insert name here, fans, right? Like Alexander and Magnus Andalus fans, right? Obviously I'm nowhere near uh, influential or have a, a large enough following to, to warrant someone doing that, but you know, at some tipping point, that becomes a thing. Why? Sense of belonging, community. So, this is why childhood development and parenting is so important. It can't be understated how what you get influenced to when you're young and the peers, the environment, the types of leadership or lack of leadership that you're exposed to can severely screw you up or set you up for a really prosperous future. And we don't choose our parents. No one chooses to be born. You're here one day, then you're gone in another. So at least while we're here, can we choose to rewrite our own programs and shape our own habits on our own volition, off our own back? Did you choose to believe in the God you believe? Did you really logically think that through? Did you critically think that and analyze why that's something you wouldn't want to assimilate into your values and beliefs? Or was it indoctrinated into you? Were you just taken to church from a young age or taken to the temple or, or the monastery or uh, from a young age repeatedly? And that's just what you knew. That's what you know. But is it what you want? Does it act? Who, who are you? Did you choose that? Or does someone choose it for you? Behaviors are imitated by the close, the many, and the powerful. People around us, popularity, and influential. Another word for those words. We'll start with number one, imitating the close. Proximity matters. We pick up habits from people around us, our friends, our family. They provide an invisible peer pressure of influence that pulls us towards certain behaviors. So this is most seen in the in the family home. It's seen in social clubs, sporting clubs. There is an invisible veneer of peer pressure that we want to assimilate to because of social belonging. There was a 12,000 person, 32 year study that found a person's chances of becoming obese increased 57% if he or she had a friend who became obese. Another example we see is if one partner loses weight in a relationship, the other would also lose weight one, about one third of the time. You know, you become the people you surround yourself with, right? So if you, how, do you improve, how do you create a better world? You improve yourself. You aim upwards towards betterment yourself because the people around you, they can't help but get a little bit better because we imitate those in close proximity to us, subconsciously and consciously. Now, if it's even accelerated, if that person admires us, looks up to us, or we are powerful in some way. So you wanna know how to change the world? Well, go with changing yourself first. And one of the best ways to build better habits is to join a group, a culture, a community where your desired behavior is the normal behavior. So the new habit seems much more achievable when you witness others doing the same thing that happened every day. So you want, that's a little hack. You want to surround yourself with people who have the habits you want to have and you will rise together. The boat rises, what do they say? The boat rises with a rising tide, something, something, something. It's like you will all rise together as the tide rises. You are the average all of each other. And I think this is such a useful thing because whether you, whatever it is, 
you want to become, what do you want to become better at? What do you want to work on? Okay, go find the people who are doing that thing and who are excelling at it and doing it better than you. You want to be a better athlete? Where are the athletes who are excelling in your sport going? Where are they hanging around? What are their habits? What communities are they a part of? What teams are they a part of? Go there. Train with them. Join that group. Maybe you're finding it difficult to, like, your training intensity, exercise intensity is a hard thing. Well, go train with somebody who's a hard worker, who that, that comes natural to them. And your level, you will rise to the level of them. And maybe not all the way there yet, but you're going to rise more than you would have if you were by yourself. So join a culture where your desired behaviors are the normal expected behavior. You want to be cleaner, more hygienic? Go live with people who are like that. You want to be more conscientious and industrious? Same thing. I think the example of this is like a women's only gym. Uh, another example is Steve Camp created a company called Nerd Fitness for video game lovers to get in shape. So now you're associating something you love, a culture where you can be quite accepted because, you know, video games can be admonished and actually stereotyped and stigmatized in the health and fitness community as a hedonistic waste of time. But what if you couple the two together? Nerd fitness. What a great idea. Now, there are thousands of gamers who typically maybe would have been intimidated and at the same time, thousands of women who maybe would have been intimidated by that. And then let's go up again. Like there's uh, trans communities, there's LGBTQ communities, there's uh, communities for children, right? Where walking into a typical gym may be quite intimidating and off-putting. So can we create subcultures within cultures to help facilitate that? And now, make it more appealing and desirable for you to be a part of such a positive habit, which is a healthier lifestyle. We know many people feel out of place the first time they go to a gym, but if you're already, if you're already similar to other members of the group, change becomes more appealing and easier because it feels like something people like you are already doing. It feels easier because you can you can see that oh he's just like me he's not she's not that different from me, you know, similar background, similar academics, similar build, right? I talk we talk kind of similar we like kind of similar things, and so it becomes easier because if someone just like you someone who looks like you has done it before then why can't you do it or at least try and do it. Maybe you can't do it the exact same way, but why can't you try and do it and do it in an approximation to the best way you can do it? But you know someone like you has done it. So it's like the model. It's like someone's done the sculpture and it gives you confidence that you can sculpt your own. Nothing sustains motivation better than belonging to the tribe. It transforms a personal quest into a shared one. And this is a beautiful thing. This is, it turns a personal quest into a shared one. And what is life if it is not to be shared? All your trials, tribulations, and heroic efforts, and triumphs in life. If you didn't have someone to come home to and celebrate it with, or friends to communicate it to, how would it really feel? Your identity becomes linked to those around you. Growth and change is no longer an individual pursuit. It becomes a shared one. We are ex-athletes we are painters we are musicians the shared identity reinforces your personal identity this is why staying a part of a group after achieving a goal is crucial for maintaining those habits biggest loser contestants what happens after they leave they get isolated away from their group and tribe that they once trained with no wonder the recidivism of re relapsing back into poor health is so high for biggest loser contestants not only is their environment now poorly suited and didn't change at all, like we talked about in the earlier chapters, but they lose their community and tribe that was so positively reinforcing for those habits. So yeah, you go to a different country or a different state or a different community and you, you transform yourself in many ways and you're a different person when you're around this, this community. But 
how you need to think about when you go back to your environment, how can you create that environment that was alike to the one you just came from where you were so prosperous? Number two, imitating the many. Whenever we are unsure of how to act, we look to the group to guide the behavior. This is also a cognitive bias as well, or a logical fallacy, can't remember which one, uh, that we, just because something has a lot of people behind it, we have a tendency to think it is more true, okay? But uh, I really like to quote, when you fall on the side of the majority, it's time to pause and reflect. Just because the majority is doing something doesn't make it right, correct, efficient, all the way. And also, my, I need to talk to my contrarian self that likes to sometimes, you know, uh, be quite skeptical. It also doesn't make it untrue. Just because the majority of people are doing a thing, I might be biased to think, well, why is that? I don't want to be like the majority of people. So there's an identity, that's like an identity uh, conflict. So, but at the same time, just because a lot of people drive on the right side of the, or everybody drives on the right side of the road doesn't mean it's wrong. Just because some people, yeah, so I'll leave it at that example. This is why we trust reviews, because we want to imitate the best buying habits. But the normal behavior of the tribe can often overpower the desired behavior of the individual. Because the reward of being accepted is often greater than the reward of being right. And I think this is so beautifully put. The reward of being accepted is often greater than the reward of being right. You know, just because you have a point to prove doesn't mean you need to prove a point. Matthew McConaughey said that. I'm just like, that's it. We all have points to prove. I talk, you know how many hours I talk for? You know how many books that I've summarized? How many hundreds, maybe thousands of hours I've sat here, whether it's my knowledge on the human body or it's my uh, understanding of human psychology and behavior. I got some points to prove, right? <laughs> I got some things that I know that I could feel pressure to be like, yeah, yeah, yeah well, that's actually wrong. Uh, that's not entirely correct. Uh, the science in that isn't actually, you know, and so we all have our area of expertise and domain of excellence. But often being accepted can be of greater utility than being right. Because being right in the face of a large group who thinks the opposite to you can make you an outcast. And sometimes you need to die your, on your own sword, right? You need to die, be willing to die on your own sword. You know you're right. You know this is important to you. Sometimes you got to do that. But, but sometimes you got to pick your battles. And like why, if, if it's, why uh, pick a battle over such a small insignificant detail? So you know you're right. But is it worth creating a conflict over? Is it worth distancing your connection to the community and tribe? Maybe not. Because most would rather be wrong with the crowd than right by themselves. And I think this says a lot about human behavior and our need and evolutionary necessity to belong. But it's also very important to be aware of it because this is how we can trick ourselves as well. There's been numerous instances throughout history. You know, I'm not going to sit here and try and remember, you know, some meaningful ones. But they're out there that you know when an expert is right. And he or she isn't proven right and many de until making many decades later, often until after their death. We, we see this a lot in the science and technology world where whether it's thinking the earth was round. Sorry, guys, for those who still think it's flat. A um, little bombshell. Whether people think the earth is was round, or was round and they got outcast and shunned and put on a stake or burnt at the stake or whether they thought the sun revolved around the earth or the earth revolved around the sun. It's like we had these perspectives when we were earlier through history and a lot of people would die actually and be or outcast from the, literally outcast and kicked out of the town for their outlandish cynical, not cynical, but their outlandish thoughts and values and opinions, right? Now we're not as brutal generally, you know. You, you might get 
you might get some angry people on the internet who say some bad words to you, right? Psh, all right. Uh, but actually can hurt a lot of people emotionally. You know, it's a real thing. You know, a lot of people don't deal with that well. However, you're probably not going to die or be outcast from planet Earth, okay? Or the town. <laughs> and be like, can you imagine? Like, oh, you can't live here anymore. The uh, the the prime minister, the president has um, no longer allowed you to live in this country and, and or state because... You have some opinions that we don't agree with, but that is like a similar ish approach that that was occurring, you know, just a couple thousand years ago, a couple hundred years ago, not even. Most would rather be wrong with the crowd than be right by themselves because the stakes were so high. Now the stakes have changed. They're different. It's not a maybe a threat so much to our survival, actual being, but it's a threat to our social identity. It's a threat to our reputation. It's a threat to our ability to uh, make money to run a business, to be a citizen. So when changing your habits means challenging the tribe, change is unattractive. But when changing your habits means fitting with the tribe, change is attractive. Now, there are some people who live their life going against that. There are some people who live their life, they're like the David, like if those who have listened to David Goggins' Can't Hurt Me audiobook, he is a guy who will die on his own sword every day of the week and rather challenge the tribe and be the outlier outcast than necessarily go with the tribe. Now, he admits himself like that has been a mistake of his, that he is, well, it's been an error of his that has cost him certain opportunities in the past, things he has to live with now. And so... I think as long as we acknowledge the potential consequences, live how you want to live, obviously, but at least be aware that there are ramifications to dying on your own sword and being so steadfast and bullheaded and bullish and dogmatic where you can't pull back your own opinions because you just want to be heard and be right. There's a danger in that. Lastly, imitating the powerful. Many of our behaviors are imitating of the people we admire and the status and prestige that they hold. Getting approval, respect, and praise from behaviors is an attractive form of positive reinforcement for our behaviors. On the other hand, we are motivated to avoid behaviors that would lower our status. Without going too long or deep into status and hierarchies, which we talked about in my summary of 12 rules for life uh, or, bunch, or just a bunch of lobsters trying to climb the hierarchy but it's important to be aware that it, well it obviously feels good to feel praise and admiration from someone you admire right that, that's quite humbling it feels good it's dopamogenic it means you it feels like you're on the right path as we talked about in the last chapter you can get manipulated f very easily through this be aware that your who the praise is coming from and what agenda they may have by giving you that praise. Perhaps trying to get you to do something or think something or believe something that supports their bias and agenda. Not everyone is... There are malevolent creatures and people out there who will prey upon the impressionable and unskeptical people who are just willing to just, yes, sir. Oh, wow. Yes, that's it. Thank you. Wow. I'm really, thank, thank you so much. Oh, yes, I'm going to do that. Just like yes men or yes women who are very easily influenced by people with just a bit of a status or money or wealth or acumen and skill and knowledge. So we must be, we must deploy healthy skepticism. And, you know, I think to summarize, to sum it up, then, you're never as good as they say you are, and you're never as bad as they say you are. I've felt this because I've put out hundreds of videos and podcasts, and you know, over the years, like I've been doing this like quite a long time, like six years now, something like that. And I've received some pretty like profound, like wow, comments from people and messages from people. But at this point, it's like, you can't drink your own Kool-Aid. You have to stay like a, quite a bit detached. I, I, I rarely read comments anymore 
One, because time. Two, because on YouTube that is anyway. There's so many, which is a great problem to have. And I recognize there's the there's the Joe Rogan perspective and the Gary Vaynerchuk perspective. Read everything, respond to everybody. And the read nothing, stay detached. I take it how it comes depending on the time. But anyway, you can't drink your own Kool-Aid too much. You're never as good as they say you are and they're never as bad as they say you are. I can't believe all the nice things that you guys would say about me. And I can't believe all the crazy, like weird shit that some of you say about me or on my videos, right? It's like the, the, the tr it's usually somewhere in the middle. I'm probably not that good and I'm probably not that bad. And it probably doesn't matter too much. But the concepts and theories behind this are relatively sound and rooted in long-standing principles of human behavior and psychology. And that's, I think, we should focus more of our time on rather than the face that's talking. Because I'm just, I'm just a vessel. I'm just a vehicle. I'm just like transmitting information and energy that is coming into me from wherever. So th that's the three. Behaviors are imitated by the close, the many, and the powerful. Understand how you may be manipulated by others and yourself and trick yourself into certain behaviors that you not, may not be keenly aware and conscious of. Also to that, the pull of social norms. Being a part of the tribe has its utility, but also there is times to question it. And also there are times to even know you know you're right, to sit back, be quiet, because it is detrimental for you to be an outcast oftentimes than to be right on a smaller, maybe inconsequential detail. But at some times, you will have to die on your own sword for the things you truly, truly believe in. So that is the role of family, friends, and peers in shaping your habits. Next video will be chapter 10, which will be about half, we're halfway through this series and analysis, how to fix the causes of your bad habits. The playlist for all these is on YouTube if you guys want to go back and see them or if you want to see the 12 rules for life, 40 hours of power, how to influence and influence people. Every book I do is like, if you want to know like my favorite books, well, one, there's a link below. There's an Amazon link to like my most impactful books. But two, look at the books that I'm summarizing and they're there. If I'm, if I'm doing it, if I'm dedicating 100, 200 hours, you know that's a damn good book. Read and study that. That's just my perspective. You know, this is like, all right, he, he's imitating the powerful, right? If you think I am, uh, how should I say? If someone was to perceive me as influential or powerful or so you, someone you admire, like perhaps one of you, a couple of you admire myself or my prestige or status or whatever it may be, a quality. Well, that's going to influence you. So be aware of that because what's my agenda, Right. Won't go into that, but just to be aware of it is a perfect example of happening right now. If you guys want to see all these, hit the notifications uh, on YouTube just so you're notified when the videos come out. And these are on all podcast platforms by looking up Alexander Emanuel Sandalis on all podcast platforms. You can go to my website, all links below, etc., etc., etc. If you want it, you know where to find it. I'll see you guys in the next one. Thank you.